Milton's Paradise Lost is the last great epic in the Western tradition. And we know that he had first intended to write an epic about the Arthurian legend. And Milton thought he could set his sights a little bit higher and write something with a more cosmic scope. And so he decided to write about the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The metaphysical poets came up with what are called conceits, that is analogies or metaphors that are unusual, that even take some work to figure out. They're creative, they're different, they're kind of mind-bending sometimes. Shakespeare has given us a play that shows justice opening up into mercy, the letter of the law being enforced so that mercy can season justice. The British Empire controls something like 75% of the land mass of the planet. Liberty, equality, fraternity. Liberty is all very well, but you cannot talk about whether, whether liberty is good or bad without saying when and for whom. The Romantic movement, a privileged instead of reason, emotion, intuition, imagination as sources for meaning, truth, and significance. The scientific revolution was really a continuation of Plato's project of describing the physical universe with mathematics. But it wasn't until Isaac Newton invented calculus that this Pythagorean Platonic project could really take off. Indeed, Newton was the culmination of the scientific revolution, and he was also the fulfillment of Plato's Pythagorean dream. Reason became the new authority, sometimes above the church and certainly above Aristotle. And so the scientific revolution of the 1600s sparked the enlightenment of the 1700s, an intellectual movement that has largely shaped our culture today. Dickens deliberately wanted to change people's hearts about how they treated people. And he used Christmas to make people be more sensible and sensitive to those around them. All of her novels are about the doings of people in the countryside and rural areas in England, their relationships, their small concerns on a small local level. But that's what makes them so delightful and so timeless. One of the reasons this is the most famous chapter in the story is because this sort of encapsulates what may be Dostoevsky's answer, his answer to the problem of evil. The answer doesn't come with our intellectual arguments. Remember what Edmund Burke said about the wisdom that comes from generations upon generations, from a nation or a culture growing slowly over time and developing a wisdom that's greater in its cumulative size than any one human lifetime could ever achieve. In-person conventions are canceled this year, so we are bringing the convention to your home. April 20th through 27th, enjoy all the deepest discounts we normally reserve for conferences and conventions, including free shipping. During the sale, we will also feature full lectures from Old Western Culture, as well as a virtual booth time, live videos where we will discuss our products and answer questions in real time. Get all the details at romanroadsmedia.com. Welcome back to Old Western Culture. We're in the fourth unit of the fourth year. Uh, we've been talking about uh, 19th century literature, and in the last lecture we started talking about Jane Austen, one of the most popular authors from the early 19th century. In fact, one of the most popular authors of all time. Uh, I mentioned the uh, polls that were taken in England and Australia within the last 12, 15 years uh, that put it at or near the top. In Australia, it was the top and this is a poll of uh, tens of thousands of people, maybe over 100,000 people that participated. Uh, in England, uh, it was second only to Lord of the Rings, 
uh, by Tolkien. Um, so uh, you, there will be, um, uh, that's, that's, I, th I think that's an uh, interesting um, uh, food for thought. Why was Tolkien more influential than Jane Austen? But why was Jane Austen still so high, second, uh, above all other uh, um, uh, contenders? Well, uh, in the last lecture, we talked about how the first half of the book unfolds. It un unfolds from, Jane, uh, from, from Elizabeth, rather, from Elizabeth's perspective. Um, and th this raises something that we could talk about now. Uh, Pride and Prejudice uh, uh, is built entirely on conversation, right? Uh, there's no uh, sort of narrative that goes like, uh, Jane walked into the room, batted her long eyelashes at the hunky Mr. Darky, Darcy who walked in with, uh, who brushed his hook. And there's no description. Uh, it's, all, it's all from the perspective of conversation. Uh, people talking uh, unfold the uh, unfolds the story. Uh, people's words, sometimes their thoughts, but usually their conversation, uh, unpack and unfold and narrate the story for us. So everything comes to us in the, in, in the context of conversations of dialogue, and everything come, uh, almost everything comes from, from Elizabeth's perspective. So uh, we, we have the interesting prospect of a story that develops through one character's eyes, and Elizabeth in the first half of the story uh, is proud of her uh, own abilities, of her discernment, of her, uh, uh, of her uh, resistance to manipulation and deception, and yet she is pre precisely manipulated and deceived in the first half of the story because she develops a prejudice early on against Mr. Darcy and then is vulnerable and susceptible uh, to the blandishments of Mr. Wickham who comes along and tells her a smooth story about Mr. Darcy and how he's mistreated uh, Wickham uh, and Elizabeth believes it. Uh, so her, pr her pride and her prejudice conspire against her. Um, and because uh, the story is told from her perspective and through her conversations primarily with other people, uh, we, the audience, uh, are kind of taken, uh, taken in along with her, which is great because when the change comes in the story later on, we change along with Elizabeth. We're not allowed to be sort of Olympian and aloof and watching what happens in a sort of knowing way, oh, it's about time Elizabeth got over her pride and prejudice. Rather, we're there with her. We're going through the same process. So... Uh, we're sort of like learning what life is like by being with her along the way. Do you remember uh, in year three, if you were with us then, and I hope you were, we talked about Dante ascending Mount Purgatory. And as he ascends Mount Purgatory, he comes across the, the terrace of the proud. And the proud are walking along bent under these heavy uh, boulders that are put on their backs, forcing them into a bodily posture of humility, forcing them to bend their stiff necks and their stiff backs in a way that they never would in life. Dante, who does not have a boulder placed on his back, also bows himself so he can walk along at their level, showing that, I, that he identifies uh, with, their, with, their, uh, with their sin of pride and now their contrition and their repentance from it. He himself acknowledging that he was guilty of pride and now is engaging in the same repentance that they are. Uh, so um, I don't want to make too much of this, but, when I, uh, but, but I think that when we as readers uh, are, are asked to see the world through Elizabeth eye, Elizabeth's eyes and we commit the same mistake that she does, pride and prejudice, then when she changes and we change along with her and we re realize to our shame that we prejudge the situation, we prejudge the person, uh, we go through, you might say, a sort of repentance, um, we learn something. Now, um, think about this. Uh, I, I asked you in the, uh, in the assignment to look at how the, how the change happens in, this, in, in the second half of the book. How does it happen? Uh, in chapter 34, Mr. Darcy comes to Elizabeth and he proposes. Remember, this is her second proposal. Mr. Collins proposed disastrously. Mr. Darcy comes and proposes even more disastrously because uh, he, uh, as he says, uh, he wishes he weren't there. He says uh, in his, his, first, his opening line is, in vain have I struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. Well, uh, in itself, that, that, that could be great. You know, I, I, my, my feelings are too strong. I can't, I, I can't master myself. Um, uh, my love for you is just overwhelming. Uh, so that could be cool. But then he goes on and talks about how the reason, uh, the, the, the things that his love is, is overwhelming is his revulsion on her family, his disgust at her low condition, his sense of her inferiority, of its being a degradation, of the family obstacles which judgment had always opposed inclination, judgment which he and she both value 
Remember, she's a woman of sense, not just sensibility. Uh, so judgment should be opposed, good judgment, good wisdom, uh, real wisdom should oppose this match, but I just can't help myself. Like Frank and you've got mail, I can't help myself. So Mr. Darcy in his proposal says, against my better judgment, against all the dictates of sense, I love you. Uh, you look, you got a rotten family, you're of low position, you know, your, 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 your sister was cold to my friend. Uh, and so uh, Elizabeth reacts with great hostility. She says, how can you expect me to receive your proposal with warmth? When you betrayed my sister and are the cause of misery, you destroyed her happiness and your friend uh, Mr. Bingley's. Um, how can you expect me to receive your proposal with warmth when you've been so arrogant? So she shuts him down in a big way, and, the, and then that scene is over. Uh, but in the next chapter, uh, he shows up. She's kind of embarrassed to see him, but he just hands her a letter and goes away, not in, intruding on her. And she reads the letter, and the, and the letter comprises the bulk of the next chapter, chapter 35. And in the letter, uh, he says, Yes, I separated Bingley from Jane because she clearly didn't love him. I was trying to protect my friend. So he agrees that he did what he did. Uh, uh, he agrees, but he has a reason for it. Uh, if you've studied classical rhetoric, uh, you know that this, uh, this falls under the, under the, uh, under the, the, uh, the rubric, uh, under the, the umbrella of forensic rhetoric. In forensic rhetoric, uh, in, uh, in, in, in judicial rhetoric, in a law court, uh, you can refuse the charge or you can accept the charge but say uh, it's not unlawful. Or you can say, you can accept the charge, say it's unlawful, but you had uh, exculpatory, exculpatory reasons for, for engaging in it. Mr. Darcy here accepts the charge. Yes, I separated Jane and Bingley, but it's because I love my friend. She clearly didn't love him back. Now, Elizabeth knows that's wrong, but from Mr. Darcy's perspective, it's understandable. Much more importantly is his defense of himself where he rejects the charge that he treated Wickham badly. He explains the situation in a way that she had never anticipated. He says, Mr. Wickham had, yes, indeed been a favorite of his father, Mr. Darcy's father. Mr. Darcy's father was going to give an inheritance to Mr. Wickham. Um, the Mr. Darcy the, uh, uh, Sr. dies. Uh, the younger Darcy, our, our hero Mr. Darcy, uh, um, uh, has Wickham approach him and says he would like, instead of his inheritance, he would like to have um, a cash payment, you know, 3,000 pounds or whatever it was. He wants a cash payment. Mr. Darcy pays it out. Wickham goes away, spends it to the spendthrift fashion, and then having wasted, like, a prod like the prodigal son, having wasted his, his, his cash payment, comes back and still expects his inheritance. Mr. Darcy refuses it and said, no, you took a cash payment instead of it. Uh, and then Mr. Wickham, being, uh, being uh, the unsavory character that he, the character that he is, uh, seduces Mr. Darcy's younger sister and tries to run away and elope with her bringing shame on the family and so on. So <clears throat> Mr. Darcy's explanation of why he's rejected Wickham and how it's in fact Rick Wickham who's mistreated the Darcy's so badly it comes as a total shock and surprise to Elizabeth. So she begins to rethink in chapter 36 everything she'd thought about Mr. Darcy in the first half of the book. Uh, she feels a sense of shame, especially at uh, the fact that she herself, against her former principles, had been so prejudiced. Uh, had, had not allowed herself uh, to think properly. She grew absolutely ashamed of herself. Of neither, Dar of neither Darcy nor Wickham could she think without feeling that she had been blind, partial, prejudiced, absurd. How despicably have I acted, she cried. I who have prided myself on my discernment. I who have valued myself on my abilities. Who have often disdained the generous candor of my sister and gratified my vanity in useless or blamable mistrust. How, humility, how humiliating is this discovery, yet how just a humiliation. Had I been in love, I could not have been more wretchedly blind. But vanity, not love, has been my folly. Pleased with the preference of one, Wickham, and offended by the neglect of the other, Darcy, on the very beginning of our acquaintance, I have courted prepossession and ignorance and driven reason away where either were concerned. Till this moment, I never knew myself. So here in this passage, in chapter 36, she's ashamed of herself. She says, I did everything that I should have known better about. And so now, although she's not in love with Darcy, she's beginning to see that there's another side of the story, differently enough that her whole picture of Mr. Darcy may need to be, or started to be, revised. Then in the second half of the book, uh, uh, notice again, as we continue this idea of how does the change come about, uh, 
<laughs> one of the things that happens, a very famous episode, is she goes to Pemberley, Mr. Darcy's estate, thinking, as she's traveling on this journey with her, with her uncle and aunt Gardner, thinking that Mr. Darcy's away for the day, they can safely go. She's, she's embarrassed to meet him because she's treated him pretty badly. Thinking he's away, they're going to go visit his manor, this incredibly beautiful and wealthy mansion. And when they go and they visit and they tour it, among the things that happen is they encounter one of Mr. Darcy's servants. And given Elizabeth's uh, prejudice against Mr. Darcy, she would have expected the servants to be grumbling and, and uh, you know, malcontents at Mr. Darcy's overbearing and high-handed attitude. But no, what actually happens is the servant praises Mr. Darcy and says he's the best master we could ever have imagined. They, they love him. They think he's gracious and kind to him. And, and Elizabeth is shocked. Is this the Mr. Darcy I thought I knew? And then, of course, Mr. Darcy comes home early, and they bump into each other, and he's kinder than she expected, and she's kind of hum uh, humble in, in, in response, and a little bit of affection, a little bit of feeling starts to grow, but, you know, who knows? And then, just as this trip is kind of proceeding nicely, she hears word from home that the real disaster of the entire story has happened. Lydia has run away with Mr. Wickham, who now shows his real character. He seduces and, 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 and runs off with Lydia makes her think that he's in love with her, and Lydia, the youngest of Elizabeth's sisters, runs off with him. And now Elizabeth is so humiliated and so embarrassed and so ashamed, she doesn't even want to see Mr. Darcy. Oh, now he'll really think we're just the wretchedest of wretched. And so she goes back home and hears nothing more about Mr. Darcy, thinking, well, that's a loss. Just when she was starting to think maybe something could happen, you know, her idiot sister and this fat-headed Wickham run off to London. So she goes home. Uh, and, and of course, as things develop, um, and by the way, um, notice how she found out about Lydia and Wickham. A letter comes to her, right? She's sitting in, her, in, her, in, her, in the inn, in her room in the inn. She's reading the letter. Uh, her face goes ashen. You know, she's discovering what's happened. And then Mr. Darcy comes in and he discovers through her lips. Remember, everything happens through conversation. So she's discovering first through the words of a servant in the manor. And then Mr. Darcy himself in his, in his uh, um, uh, amazingly kind response. And now uh, she, she discovers things through a letter. So, so she's discovering things are, things are uh, being unfolded to her. There's no action. In fact, in the whole story, there's no action. There aren't car chases, gun battles, explosions. There's conversation. People take a turn about the drawing room. But there's conversation. There's words. But they discover things about each other now, especially in the second half of the book that they hadn't known before. So here comes our Greek play. Which Greek play turns entirely on discovery, on characters standing on stage and doing nothing but having a conversation. Which Greek play that we talked about back in year one has, has a shepherd come on stage, say some stuff, go away. A messenger comes on stage, says some stuff, goes away. And the king, there's your first clue, stands there and listens and goes, huh, this is interesting. What? You mean those people weren't my real parents? There's your second clue whose wife is standing next to him. There's your third clue. It's Oedipus the King by Sophocles. Aristotle, in one of his works called The Poetics, says that one of the finest kinds of plot is the plot of discovery, where there's no real action, but the character begins to learn things by which everything changes. And we, the audience, learn along with the actors. And in Oedipus the King, the character Oedipus having saved Thebes from the, from, from, from the Sphinx, having become the king, married this widowed woman, having children by her, and then the plague breaks out. Who's responsible for this plague? Tiresias comes and says, it's you. Oedipus says, how can it be me? And then he starts discovering all these horrible things, that the prophecy which said he would kill his father and marry his mother have, in fact, come true. Against his, against his knowledge, against his will, certainly, so uh, uh, Aristotle in the Poetics says that Sophocles' play, The Oedipus, is one of the finest plays because of the plot of discovery. And that's what we have in Pride and Prejudice. It's entirely a plot of discovery. Everything is conversation. People go for walks. People write letters. They converse in whispers at balls. They take turns about the library. Uh, they visit. They propose. They get rejected. It's all about conversations, but in the conversations, in words, things are discovered. The word of a servant reveals something new about Mr. Darcy. The words from Mr. Darcy himself reveal a side of his character we could have anticipated. A letter from London. Lydia and Wickham have run off. So it's a plot of discovery. So uh, I, I, like to, I like to say that you know, Jane Austen, uh, the Pride and Prejudice, is like Oedipus the King. Peas in a pod.
Plots of discovery. Now, of course, there's all kinds of ways in which they're different, but that's an interesting way to think about it. It's a, it's a novel of discovery. We discover by words and conversation things we didn't know before because we, along with Elizabeth, were proud and were prejudiced. So uh, she, d she finds out later that someone has persuaded Lydia and Wickham to be married, and she assumes it's her Uncle Gardner who got involved. And she and her family are thinking, how can we ever repay our gratitude to Uncle Gardner for taking care of this family shame and dishonor? Uh, and then, later on, uh, when Lydia and Wickham come to visit, with no sense of shame at all, they come to visit the Bennett family, uh, back, at their, back at their home, uh, Lydia drops in her silly, thoughtless way, she drops something that should have been kept secret, that Mr. Darcy was at their wedding. And finally, uh, Elizabeth, pursuing this crumb of, of evidence, discovers that it wasn't her Uncle Gardner, but Mr. Darcy himself, who had brought about the marriage, persuaded Wickham to be married, at great personal expense and cost to his own reputation, uh, he had caused, he brought, caused them to be married, to t take the shame away. Now they're legitimate. Um, uh, he'd set them up so that they would have a living, so things wouldn't go badly. So Mr. Darcy had done it all. Uh, and Elizabeth says, uh, uh, in, in the story, Elizabeth says, uh, there's something her heart briefly said, he did it for me. But then she doesn't want to think too much about that. No, I don't know, maybe not. But then she bumps into Mr. Darcy again, and finally it all comes out. He discovers that he had. And here's the great thing about Mr. Darcy. He had done this out of love for Elizabeth, never expecting her to know. It would be one thing for a young man to do something on behalf of a young woman, hoping she'd find out and be impressed. It's another thing for a young man to do something out of love for a young woman, uh, hoping she will never find out, wanting to be anonymous, out of humility. And then she finds out that it's him and discovers that he had done it anonymously and he had done it with the intention never of being find out. This is admirable beyond belief. So Elizabeth uh, finally realizes Mr. Darcy's character is much, much greater than she thought. He's a good man. He's a man of sterling character. He's a man of loyalty. He's a man of faithfulness. He's a man of integrity. You know, so there's a reason Mr. Darcy is the epitome kind of, uh, of the, you know, the ideal husband. And when I was uh, uh, much younger in my college days, a uh, number of uh, friends and I, which included some guys and the girls, we would sit around talking about literature, and uh, the girls came up with this idea that uh, you could rate a guy by how many Darcy's he was. Is he an 8 out of 10, or is he a full 10 Darcy? Um, and the reason is, uh, Dar uh, Mr. Darcy here, by the end of the story, reveals himself to be just the kind of man that a woman would want. Uh, so Mr. Darcy turns out to be uh, uh, full of honesty, integrity, and a real kind of humility. He, uh, he undoes the pride in the first half, by the humility in the second half, the humility expressed in doing something for Elizabeth and not expecting public acknowledgement. Uh, and his undoing of his prejudice in the first half, uh, wherein he realizes that her family, because of his love for her, uh, for her, her, her family is worth something to him. And Elizabeth, Elizabeth's pr pride and prejudice are both undone as well. Having discovered, having learned what Mr. Darcy's true character is, and having realized that she herself has been badly mistaken and trusted too much in a, in a one-sided uh, perspective, um, uh, you know, her pride and prejudice are undone as well. And by the end of the story, of course, they marry. Uh, and so do Jane and Bingley. Uh, Mr. Darcy realizes that Jane did love Bingley, and so happy ending. Jane and Bingley get married, Darcy and Elizabeth get married. Uh, and of course, I've skipped over one really fun episode where uh, <clears throat> uh, Lady Catherine de Bourgh comes to visit Elizabeth, and she has heard rumor whispers in the wind and she comes and she wants Elizabeth to deny that she will ever marry Mr. Darcy. And Elizabeth, not believing she'll ever have any chance, but not wanting to be buffaloed by this woman, says, no, I won't promise that. Later on, Lady Catherine goes home and she, in a huff, uh, tells uh, uh, Mr. Darcy. And Mr. Darcy realizes that Elizabeth probably loves him. So he goes and he proposes and they get married. Uh, it's a great episode. Um, uh, and uh, in, in, that, uh, in that interview between Lady Catherine and Elizabeth, when Lady Catherine's trying to, trying to you know, um, run roughshod over Elizabeth, she, uh, she says, will the shades of Pemberley be thus polluted? It's a great line. Uh, it's right up there with Mr. Mr. Collins' awkward proposal. So we come to the end of the story, uh, the, and the story is concluded with Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy having learned each other and having approached each other and come together uh, in love and in marriage,
uh, not by overthrowing the, 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 the social conventions that kind of hamper, uh, hamper them all the time, like Lydia and Wickham did. Lydia and Wickham just throw off social conventions and run off together. Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth don't do that. Now, um, think, about, think about the movies that have been made. I know you've seen some of them. The movies that have been made of Pride and Prejudice. Far and away, in everybody's estimation, far and away the best one is the BBC version running to something like six hours done back in the 90s uh, with Colin Firth playing Mr. Darcy and Jennifer Early playing uh, Elizabeth. Beautifully, beautifully done. Very faithful to the, uh, to the, uh, to the story, to the novel. Uh, and, and of course, Colin Firth uh, as an actor got great popularity by playing uh, just a perfect Mr. Darcy. Uh, the movie is faithful to the, to the, to the novel. Um, except for one scene, and I know you've probably seen the series, and if you haven't, I urge you to watch it. It's well worth it. It's one of the few movies that is very faithful to the novel, uh, except for this one scene uh, where, where, Jane, uh, where Elizabeth and, the, and her uh, aunt and uncle are visiting Pemberley, and Mr. Darcy comes home early. He comes home early, and not knowing they're there, you know, he kind of takes off his overcoat, and he dives into the lake, and he swims across the pond. He comes out all dripping and hunky, and that's when he meets Elizabeth. That's not in the novel. There's a concession to romanticism. Okay, we can forgive that because it's just one scene. But more recently, uh, uh, um, within the last 10 years, another, another movie has been made of Pride and Prejudice. It's the one starring Kiera Knightley, who's a famous actress. She was in Pir Pirates of the Caribbean uh, and so on, a lot of action movies. But she plays Elizabeth uh, in this new version of Pride and Prejudice. Now, uh, here's something very interesting. They try in this movie to kind of recapture faithfully the look and the feel of the Bennett family. But I object to this movie, and I want to explain why. Think about this. I've told you that Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen, live in the age of, of the Romantics, but she is not a Romantic. She's a Burkean. She's a conservative. She believes that we don't overthrow the society and the constrictions of social convention. We live within them because they have the pur a purpose. But the Romantics who, who lived and wrote in her own day, Byron Shelley especially, were all about throwing off social convention. So I ask you this question. Who in, who in this novel is the one who follows the dictates of her heart and throws off convention to follow her heart? It was Lydia and Wickham. And they're the bad guys. They're the ones who, who, are, who are potentially destroying things in the story. And they're saved by a man who represents tradition and manners and custom, Mr. Darcy. And Elizabeth, the woman who loves him, who also respects and honors manners, tradition, custom, the mores of the time. They're the Burkeans. So this is an anti-romantic novel. It has romance in it, that is, love interest, but it's anti-romantic in that it does not share the spirit of the Romantic age, which is all about destroying the traditions of the past, like the French Revolution at the very time this was written had, been, uh, had done. So of the two movies, the BBC six-hour version and the Kiera Knightley version, which one is the more romantic? It's the Kiera Knightley version. Now, I'm not attacking her. She's a good actress. But think about that, that movie. The high point of that movie for me, the real illustration, is in the middle of the movie, uh, uh, Kiera Knightley playing Elizabeth rushes upstairs, slamming her bedroom door and shouting, why don't you all just leave me alone for once? An outburst of the heart, a cry of the heart. Elizabeth in this novel would never do that. So although that movie is, I think it's worthwhile watching. I don't, I don't have objections in other ways. The Mr. Collins I think is really good and so is the Mr. Bennett. Um, but the movie primarily misunderstands what this novel is about. That movie, as Hollywood will do, casts Pride and Prejudice as a romantic movie. That is, a, it's a movie about following the heart. And that's why, you know, the, the Kiera Knightley Elizabeth reacts the way she does. And why, you know, Kiera Knightley and, and, uh, and, and Mr. Darcy at the end of the movie are sitting all, you know, kind of sexy looking in the night shirts on a boulder on the edge of the lake in the moonlight at the very end of the movie. Because Hollywood doesn't get this. Jane Austen is an anti-romantic. She's all about love and romance, but she's not a romantic in the sense of a rejection of tradition. She's a Burkean. So the BBC version, I think, gets that right, uh, and the Kira Knightley version gets it wrong. That's my objection to it. It's not because I think it's poorly done. I think it was well done. Uh, finally, <clears throat> uh, let me read to you a poem uh, written by Mary Holtby that was published in a book several decades ago that I think is delightful. Uh, this is just a wonderful little poem that summarizes the plot of Pride and Prejudice. You can find this on the, uh, uh, on the Republic of Pemberley website if you want to look for it. It's from a, a, a book called How to Become Ridiculously Well-Read in One Evening, compiled by E.O. Parrott, published by Viking in 1985. It goes this way. <clears throat> 
Mary Well is Bennett Tennant, Bingley singly must remain, since classy Darcy Lizzie Dizzy thinks he's far too good for Jane. Rummy, mummy, jaunty, auntie, these would drag both gallants down, plus the younger siblings dribblings over officers in town. See the specious Wickham trick him with his tales of birthright gloom. See how hideous Lydia's ruin looms before she gets her groom. Classy Darcy saves the bacon, shaken out of former pride. Is he Lizzie's destined love to shove her prejudice aside? Has she clout to flout that matron, patroness of priestly cuz, he who's ludic ludicrous proposing Rosings rules like all he does? Darcy, otter, quarter, daughter, destined his through two decades. Mulish, foolish girl, remember Pemberley's polluted shades. Dare she share his great estate, or can't Aunt Catherine be defied? Yes, and ere the bells ring jingly, Bingley too shall claim his bride. To prepare for the next lecture, uh, read Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Uh, as you're reading it, uh, one of the things you can watch for is how he depicts human nature, um, how he depicts what the problem with human nature is, how he depicts what the solution might be, um, and think about how he uh, about the, the way that he describes Christmas and what Christmas is and what it's supposed to be. And we'll talk about the story in the lecture. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, the, the small example I was thinking as you were talking was uh, um, efforts to update Austin, uh, like clu <laughs> yeah. Clueless. You know Clueless? Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's it's yep. Emma. It's version of Emma, right? In in, in uh, uh, contemporary Southern California with Valley Girls, <laughs> and uh, you know, without the social structure, it, it you know, yeah, kind of doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and even if, if Lewis is right, that the, that, the, that the loss of old Western culture began in, jo in Austin's time, she wasn't part of it. I think she's a, she was anti-romantic. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that's, the, that's the problem with the, you know, the Kiara Knightley version of Pride and Prejudice and all the others. <laughs> you know, they turn into a romantic novel. <laughs> yeah, how we're faithful to the plot, they turn into a romantic novel. And Jane Austen was not part of the romantic, but she's an anti-romantic. She still yeah. holds to the old social structures and but, customs, and however irritating they are, they're part of what we have to live in. But but she did have the scene at the end of Pride and Prejudice where Elizabeth is out in a misty morning in her nightgown, and Darcy comes out in his dressing coat out onto the misty... You don't remember that at the end of Pride no, and Prejudice? I don't remember that part. <laughs> Nor do you remember the part where he plunges into the lake and comes up all dripping and hunky. I just can't remember that part. <laughs> I thought hunky was an Austin word. <laughs> Dripping and hunky. That's right. Someone was defending uh, zombie, the Pride and Prejudice zombies, as a more Austinian... Some, so, somebody else has told me this, yes. Okay. Than, I haven't than seen the yet. new version that came out. Yeah. Uh, so, I still like the A&E one, but yeah. uh, I've yeah. not seen it because Lydia refuses to watch it. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> Somebody who's an Austin fan said that they thought the Pride and Prejudice and Zombies captured uh, uh, by, you know, with the, with the, uh, the, uh, the kind of silly restaging, captured some dimensions of the actual novels right. that, uh, that some of the film versions had, hadn't. I can see how you could argue that in a restricted sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, have, by the way, this is tangential, but have you read any of the, there's, there's at least one, maybe several recent books on, uh, the influence of Anglicanism, like the prayer book in Jane Austen. Yeah, I'd, I've Have you read those. Oh, one of them, uh, some years ago, oh, I can't Anderson. remember which one it was, but the uh, uh, Austen's Anglicanism, I think, is the title. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was it any good? Uh, it was. Yeah, and there's there'd been uh, a, a couple of bi. I did a, a little biography of Austen, and I came across a couple of biographical, not not necessarily complete biographies. Morals, uh, well, no, I did a, a separate thing that was a biography that for Nelson. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's a there's a couple of biographical studies that emphasize her um, her you know her Christ, her Anglican upbringing. You know, she's yeah. a, you forget she's a PK. You know, yeah, she grows up around the church. Yeah, and uh, that puts a I think that does put a different angle on the novels. I think there's a lot mm -hmm. more. It, it she's not overtly um, religious the way some other. She's not overtly religious even as a. As something like Dickens, but yeah, um, I think there's a lot of a lot of very subtle Christian stuff going on. I'd like to read that 
I thought for a long time that something's missing not to point out that her, that her father's a minister. One, at least one of her brothers was a yeah, minister. Yeah, a couple were, right. Yeah, and she would have been, and growing up in the church, she would have been steeped in the language of the prayer yeah. book. How could that not yeah. Yeah. show up in her writing? Right. In-person conventions are canceled this year, so we are bringing the convention to your home. April 20th through 27th, enjoy all the deepest discounts we normally reserve for conferences and conventions, including free shipping. During the sale, we will also feature full lectures from Old Western Culture, as well as a virtual booth time, live videos where we will discuss our products and answer questions in real time. Get all the details at romanroadsmedia.com.